Good afternoon. Yeah, welcome to Chadev. Um, today's lunch is sponsored by Carbon Five, so let's give Carbon Five a round of applause. <laughs> and uh, S Stu Holloway came in from afar, and uh, Grok.io helped get him here, so let's give them a round of applause as well. So uh, before we get started, does anybody have any community announcements that they'd like to make uh, about meetups coming up or anything like that? I know one. Uh, CHA.js is happening February 6th. It should be happening either on this floor or upstairs in the Carbon 5 uh, office. Um, and I believe very own Andrew Rogers is going to be speaking on Glitch. So uh, come and check that out. Um, there's a meetup that will be put up soon for that. <laughs> Um, yeah, so without a f any further ado, um, Stuart Holloway is going to come in. Or come Either way. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. So hi, my name is Stuart Holloway, and this is a talk about uh, software stewardship, and particularly uh, open source software stewardship. Um, I really appreciate the chance to be here at Chadev and back in Chattanooga for the second time uh, within a year. Uh, and in addition to Carbon5 and Groxio, I definitely want to call out uh, Bruce and Maggie in particular for being excellent hosts. So this is a story in four parts. Uh, how to make software, so that's sort of a baseline. Uh, how to behave and why, uh, what you can expect to happen if you undertake to do those two things, and then, and just to foreshadow a little bit, some of the things that will happen will not be good, and so how to take care of yourself uh, in that process. And, but before we get into those four things, I wanna start with the personal story and how I got here. So uh, from 2005 to 2007, uh, my friend Rich Hickey, uh, gave himself a self-funded sabbatical. So he took three years of no income uh, to design and create Clojure, the programming language, um, which I picked up um, in 2008 and have used uh, for the most part uh, since then. And so that was an enormous uh, personal risk for Rich or anybody to take. I mean, I don't know how many of you have three years of income lying in a box in the closet where you could go to your family and say, hey, I have this cool idea, it will never make any money and nobody will ever use it and I'm gonna spend three years on it. Um, which was sort of crazy. And uh, this gift of Rich's time led to some pretty amazing things. This is the uh, Stack Overflow, one of their uh, graphs from their yearly survey and the vertical axis here is salary in the United States. Uh, you can see closure is at the very top. And the horizontal axis is uh, years of professional programming experience. Uh, it would be interesting to redo this graph and control for how old the language is. Uh, but Clojure is a language in which people are very well paid, and it tends to be popular with experienced developers, despite the fact that it's a young language. And in all kinds of analysts' uh, quadrants, it sits in the top right. And it's important at the beginning of this story to say, that is absolutely crazy, right? If you rewind the software world to 2007 and say, you know what? I have a solution for you. It's a dynamic, functional, hosted Lisp. Asked for no one ever. <laughs> Nobody was looking for that. In fact, you may still find it's an uphill battle to explain to people, in some cases, why that they might want those things. But it happened, and the expected user base of zero uh, turned out to be quite a bit larger than zero. And uh, as the language grew and as more and more people got involved with it, uh, eventually, as happens, it became necessary to have conversations about conversations. And so uh, in 2011, Rich uh, sent a post to the mailing list uh, on Decorum and said, you know, look, these communication forums and the tools that we use are run by and for makers and there are some standards for how we should behave. That was not in reaction to a crisis, uh, and the closure community has never really had uh, a crisis in that sense, right? There's always people disagree, and sometimes when people disagree, 
It's not the most positive interaction in the world, but it's never been a crisis level thing. And in fact, that mailing list post was kind of the only thing that was ever said about it. Um, and I would you know, keep linking back to it. And every once in a while, uh, other people would pick it up and adopt it for their community. So Oracle and other people have adopted modified versions of this post to a mailing list uh, as uh, standards for how to behave in other communities. And so last year I finally said, you know, we should just put this on the website and have a better place to link to uh, than a Google group message about these things. Uh, meanwhile, as you roll the clock forward to almost today, suddenly in 2018, or at least so it seems to me, we're having a lot of conversation about uh, open source burnout. And probably the signature moment in that was Guido stepping down uh, from being the uh, BDFL of Python. And I don't know how many people read his email to the Python mailing list, but it made me incredibly sad. And that, that he would end up feeling so uh, beaten up you know, by this process. And if you look around, he's hardly the only person to express these kinds of thoughts. Um, just in the past month, uh, Matt, the creator of Ruby, uh, had a plaintive series of tweets that basically ended with, we're working really hard here, please be nice to us. And so there's something going on here. And certainly in my work with Clojure, I've seen it uh, and been involved with it. So what do we want to do? I want to give you life-changing advice today. I'm going to set that modest bar. I want you to be able to leave this talk and have, if you work in open source, have something that you can do specific and concrete to make your interactions with other people more positive. Um, primarily in the sense of making you feel better, but also uh, in the sense of getting things done. So the objective here is, uh, is practical advice, um, not just to say there's a problem. Um, I have some qualifications. Uh, I've been doing this for a while. I've worked in a bunch of different technologies, and I've worked in just about every role uh, you can imagine uh, in the software industry, from stakeholder to founder to CEO to CTO to developer. Um, and I have worked on Clojure since the 1.0 release. So I have, uh, I think I've read every line of code that went into Clojure since uh, 1.0. Uh, but I think the more important thing for you to know about me is that my name literally means steward. <laughs> the English name Stuart is derived from the same root uh, as stewardship. So I believe that, that my parents you know, thought that someday I would need to give this talk uh, uh, when they named me. So stewardship, you know, people say, you know, danger is my middle name. Well, stewardship is my first name. So, so let's talk about this. First thing is, how do we make software? And I want to break this making software into uh, three areas to think about. One is the process of design. And the second is, how do we grow software? So most software is not in a green field. My feeling about how long the green field lasts is like it ends when you stop, start typing, usually, on a project, even if it's a brand new uh, project. So then we're going to talk about growth, and then uh, a technical point about simplicity. So problem solving is a skill. And there are people who have thought about it hard and written about it. Uh, one great resource for this is Polya's book, How to Solve It, which is really about uh, may seem specific to solving math problems and proofs and things like that, but is really uh, much more general. But analysis and design is about identifying a problem that we're trying to solve and assessing the solution in terms of whether or not it solves the problem. And this is something that um, unfairly, I think, has gotten a bad name um, as a side effect of the Agile movement, which has been, for the most part, a valuable corrective to big upfront design as it existed certainly when my career started. But design matters too. And if you think that your agile process or test-driven development or whatever is a fast feedback loop, there is no faster feedback loop than rejecting a stupid idea in your head before it leaves your head. And there are tools and techniques for doing these things, and there are artifacts for these things. So when I think about what I do as a software developer, coding is really the very last part. And before that, there is uh, note-taking, there is problem statements, there are uh, writing rationales, you know, an explanation to somebody else why this exists, why it exists this way, what problem it's trying to solve, so that somebody else can assess that piece of software, in my case, and say, is this gonna help me uh, with what I'm doing? Uh, in particular, 
um, at Cognitech and on the product team with Datomic, we make tons of tables. Right? We very rarely write code without having a table somewhere showing three other ideas that are inferior in some columns. And we use Google Sheets because we're lazy and it's free, and, um, and it already has green and yellow and red uh, cell highlighting selected, like you can choose your own colors, but those are already there. So, I mean, we have, I, you know, I can't even imagine how many tables with, here's the thing we didn't do highlighted in red, here's the thing we didn't do highlighted in red. And this is incredibly important in software because, you know, you may think that tests are good documentation, or you may think that documentation is good documentation. I tend to lean to the latter uh, between those two. But regardless, those things don't tell you what you didn't do, right? Code very rarely tells you what you didn't do. Here's the algorithm I didn't use. It seems like the obvious solution to this problem, but it isn't for these subtle reasons that we thought through, and of course those disappear uh, in the final artifact. So I think these kinds of artifacts are important. Um, just one example, we had a lot of work in Closure 110 on uh, JIRA issue 2373, and it's worth, all these are, slides are linked and you can you know, look at this later, but it's an interesting example of our idea of the thought process that goes into code changes in Clojure, and it's quite the opposite of, say, a GitHub pull request, right? Some code happened, in fact, a lot of code happened, and there were, you know, I think maybe 25 patches uh, attached to this ticket eventually, two of which uh, eventually got into Clojure, but the vast majority of the work was trying to say the principles that we were trying to apply in English, making a proposal, and in fact, uh, several other proposals that failed, uh, and having a discussion about those things. So, it's a set of ideas about the initial design process. Now you've designed something, you've put it out in the world, and it's time to grow it. And so there are three ways you can grow your software. Um, you can grow by accretion, you can provide more new things. Uh, you can grow by relaxation. You can say, it used to be the case when you called this function, you had to give me A, B, and C. But you know what? It turns out I don't need C. If you give me just A and B, I can actually do the job for you there, do a useful job for you there. And you can also do fixation, which is bug fixing. I don't want to use the word change when talking about software because change is, is semantically content free. Right? I want to use these three words. When I'm changing a piece of existing software, I'm accreting, I'm relaxing, I'm fixing. And this is important because the industry has spent a couple of decades doing something else. Uh, which is called semantic versioning, which is completely wrong and broken. So there's a piece of actionable advice. Stop using semantic versioning. And the problem with semantic versioning is it has a set of rules. So let's imagine that I have library my slash foo version 1.0.0, and I call my slash foo 1.2, and it does something. It does the foo thing. Semantic versioning tells us that if we go to 1.1.0, that's a compatible change. So if I call the same API, I should get the same thing. And it tells us that if I go to my slash foo 2.0.0, it tells us absolutely nothing, right? That name, my slash foo, may still be present in the library. It may work as advertised. It may do something subtly different that will break you. It may depend on some new thing that you don't know about, or it may launch missiles. And the thing about it is, that there's no need to do this. If you look at these API calls, I've made a point, and this is closure, but there's not a lot of closure in this talk, but that's API calls, that the names have namespaces, right? The library has a namespace and a name, my slash foo, but the program has namespaces. When the program has namespaces, you don't need semantic versioning. My slash foo should always mean whatever my slash foo means, and if you decide you want something different, you can have my slash foo too. Microsoft used to do this back in the olden days. I don't know if they still do. Microsoft actually would add EX to their API calls in Windows, so they would have co-wait for multiple handles and co-wait for multiple handles EX, uh, which was their two. Um, and maybe even in a couple of cases they had EX, EX, which seems like a dumb way to say three, but whatever. Um, but if you don't like having your name polluted, if you don't want to have Foo2, if you're really in love with the name Foo, then you could use a new namespace. You could have my two. And you can have a new version of the library that continues to deliver both namespaces, right? My second version of the library can have my and my two in it, and my three, and so forth. And it's absolutely crazy that in general we don't do this. And I spend an inordinate amount of my time, probably two to three weeks a year, on Datomic whenever 
uh, I am compelled by some library, it's change, to change our dependency tree, that triggers a series of other compulsory changes, all of which have to be assessed against this matrix of there are these functions that have the same name that might or might not do the same thing. So we can stop doing this. The third idea I want to talk about is simplicity. And I'll start by talking about its opposite, which is something which is complected. And when things are complected, they're braided together, like in the picture there. And um, this is bad in software, right? If you have a piece of software that does A and a piece that does B and a piece that does C, then having one that does A, B, and C braided together is a terrible building block. And what's gonna happen is that somebody is gonna be under a ton of time pressure and they're gonna need A and B but not C. And what are they gonna do? They're gonna call your thing that does A, B, and C and ignore the fact that it also does C. Or they're gonna write a helper function that undoes the effect of C, right, so that they can, how many people have done that? I mean, you've done, you, have, you end up doing this, right? And you're under time pressure and you know, we need to break things apart. And this is a fun game to play like in any piece of software, to say, okay, where is there two ideas that haven't been delivered separately? Uh, my experience is, if I can identify those, even if I cannot think of a reason why I would ever want them separately, the best way to come up with that reason is to ship it. Because you will immediately go, oh yeah, now here's why I need to do those things together. And to make this quite concrete, I'll give an example from Java. This is an example of trying to stuff uh, three ideas into two slots. So when you're doing object-oriented programming, you often have a mechanism for defining interfaces. In Java, that's the interface keyword. And then you have a mechanism for defining implementations, which is a class keyword. And you have a mechanism for tying interfaces and implementations together, which, oops, the complexity alarm goes off right now. Your complexity sense should be tingling. Because at this point, you've got two ideas happening in one place. And if you want to get an idea of how bad this is, um, if you've ever used a class called string utils in any language, it's because you have this problem, right? Because you cannot attach, you made interfaces and you made uh, implementations and you don't have a third place to say, I want to, after the effect, attach uh, implementations to interfaces. Uh, many languages solve this problem, of course. Uh, Clojure does um, with the extend uh, function. So cl in Clojure, you have protocols, which are interfaces. You have types, which represent implementations. And you have extend, which says, I'm going to extend a type to an implementation. So it's possible in Clojure, and the specifics of this code don't really matter, that the, it's possible in Clojure to extend things to existing classes or interfaces. So this is extending what you can do with java.util.list and java.util.map and java.util.set, uh, which are things that I, as a Clojure programmer, do not control and I know what you know, uh, Oracle's timeline is for making changes to those interfaces, right? That's not going to happen. So this is an important idea in and of itself, right? Having interface and implementation, having the thing that connects them, I'm gonna call it extends, delivered as a separate feature in your language. But I'm presenting it here uh, as an example of what to do when you're building software, which is try to find something that's delivered together and break it apart. Try to discover those those places. All right, that's the technical stuff. Now for the fun stuff. You are gonna probably have to interact with other humans while you write software. This is going to turn out to be more challenging than your interactions with the computer. Um, if you haven't met humans before, they are, um, they are unreliable. Uh, they are prone to introduce uh, biological effects that you didn't anticipate into interactions. Um, and we have a long history of how to cope with this. Uh, there's a great book from the 1940s, How to Behave and Why, uh, that talks about honesty, fairness, strength, and wisdom. It talks about a set of principles about how to interact with each other. And I think this is a great book. Obviously, the world's major religious traditions have sets of principles for how we're going to interact with each, other's, uh, each other. Uh, governments, uh, you know, uh, national myths, right? The American story has ideas about how we should interact with each other. And um, I'm not gonna give you a capsule summary about what's good and bad about all those <laughs> today, but I wanna focus on this phrase, how to behave and why, in particular, 
uh, in the context of uh, the etiquette guide enclosure, this uh, email that Rich wrote in 2011, which I break up into sort of three pro uh, pieces. The first piece is what I call respect the process. Uh, and, this, and that's about um, learning how the process works and participating in it. The second one is knowing when to advocate for your position. And the third one is how to disagree uh, with civility. So respect the process. Um, what is a reasonable communication in a maker forum? Hey, I made something. You know, I'm in the right topical forum. I made something. You might like it. Or I'm trying to use something that was made, and I need help. Or I'm trying to make something, and I need help. Or in response to any of those things, I can help. These are good sentences. You can use them verbatim if you want. Easy, you can mix them up a little bit, too. But there's an important idea here um, about learning the norms of a community that you're joining. So, and of course, this is always challenging because, I mean, inevitably, you have those humorous moments, right, where you don't know the standards of the community, and so you bring up the ridiculous issue that's been beaten to death, you know, 500 times, and nobody wants to talk about it or whatever. But, but you can try. Uh, obviously, one way to try is when you're joining a community, you know, we're talking about internet communities here, you can peruse the past. So when you have an interesting topic to talk about, you can do a Google search for it most of the time. In Perl, you're in trouble because all the punctuation marks. But in most, in most ecosystems, you can do a search for terminology about what your problem is, and you can find out how the community interacts with that issue before you jump in uh, with your interaction. Also, it's very helpful to phrase things as questions instead of as suggestions. Like, you have a great new idea about how things could be done differently. A super way to lead into that is to ask a question about how things are being done. And, and find out and have somebody say, well, things are being done this way. It's often going to be the case uh, that there are things, that there are reasons, some good and some bad, that you don't know about yet. Then, when to advocate. So, and this is where this talk becomes specifically about open source uh, and volunteer workers. So when is it appropriate to say, you should make something? You know, this is good, but this other thing would be better, and you should work on it. Or you should work differently, right? I see you st you're still using CVS for your project. You should switch to GitHub because, gosh, right? <laughs> or, or you should help me. When is it appropriate to make this kind of advocacy? And the answer is never. Never appropriate to make this kind of advocacy. These are all statements tasking other people. Right? They're phrased, they can be phrased very politely, they can be argued articulately, but these are tasking other people. Now, entirely separate once you've banded together with a group of people and said, we're going to work on this together, and I'm going to do this, and you do that, and we're going to collaborate. But absent that shared context, and absent a, a set of, you know, a playing field for that, these are tasking other people. And this happens all over the place in open source. People who uh, are not uh, inside a working group like that show up and say, you should do this, you should do that, uh, you should do the other thing. Finally, disagree with civility, right? Surely this is going to work on the internet. So, the idea here is make your technical point. Um, if your technical point has already been made, you don't need to pound the table. You don't need to use capital letters. You can just say plus one. There's well understood uh, you know, communication standards for doing these kinds of things. Um, use logic and don't make it about people. And by don't make it about people, I don't mean you know, deny the humanity of people that you're talking to. I mean don't make it about people like you're a member of such and such uh, ethnic group or religion or sexual preference or whatever. It's not, we're building software. We're not um, controlling other people in this game. So that, you know, uh, and that's its own obvious huge mess. So disagree with, uh, with civility. So now, you've made some software and you're behaving well on the internet. And the internet maybe is not behaving well back to you, and you're going to get feedback. And to give you an idea about how dealing with feedback can go, I'm going to introduce probably the most famous 
uh, philosopher of the Agile software movement, which is Sims Tabak. Uh, Sims is an author of children's books, and I think the first story in this book, Kibitzers and Fools, um, is about Rabinovitz, the fishmonger, and his stall in the market. So Rabinovitz has a stall in the market, and the stall says, fresh fish sold here daily. And he's very happy, and he has very good fish, and he's making a good life for himself. And a kibitzer comes along one day and says, you know, you shouldn't say fresh, right? I mean, it just invites the comparison to maybe it's not fresh. Everyone knows you don't sell fish that's not fresh. You should really not say fresh. And Rabinovitz, who listens to feedback from others, he's a listener, says, okay, fish sold here daily. So the next day, another kibitzer come by, comes by and says, you know, you're in the market square. Right? You're not in the handout square. You're in the market square. Nobody expects you to give fish away. You really don't need to say sold. And Rabinovitz listens to feedback. Okay. So he changes his sign the next day to say fish here daily. You can probably see where this is going now, but it's a great story anyway. And the next day, a kibitzer comes by and says, you know, everybody knows fish is a daily item. Okay, fine. Now he has a sign that says, fish here. And the next day, a kibitzer comes to him and says, you know, we're standing in front of you. <laughs> we know where we are. We know where you are. You know where we are. You really don't need a sign that says, here. And Rabinovitz acknowledges the wisdom of this individual suggestion as he has acknowledged the wisdom of the other suggestions and now has a sign that says, fish. At which point he thinks he's done, but he's not. Uh, a kibitzer comes by the next day and says, your fish is fantastic. And it smells great and somewhat pungent. People can smell it for three blocks away. You do not need a sign that says fish. And so, Rabinowitz takes down his sign. What do you do? Fast forward a couple of weeks. Rabinowitz is standing at the stall Fish are not moving as fast as they used to in the previous iterations of the sign. And a kibitzer comes by and says, you should have a sign. <laughs> so open source is definitely about listening to feedback. But it cannot be about unguarded or uncritical listening to feedback. So we have to have a way to say, you know, the feedback has to go through some sort of consideration pipeline. And you can't please everybody. You can't come close to people pleasing everybody. If 10% of the people think you're doing a terrible job, you're doing better than Republicans or Democrats, right? If 1% of the people are, think you're doing a terrible job, you're doing better than people who believe the Earth is round. I mean, no matter what you pick, you're going to find, and it's the internet, you're going to find people who are angry. Uh, in 1958, uh, the science fiction author uh, Sturgeon uh, created this Sturgeon's Law. 90% of everything is crap. He was anticipating the internet. <laughs> Amusingly, it turns out that this is crap. It's not even called Sturgeon's Law. Sturgeon's Law is some other thing that he said. This is actually Sturgeon's revelation. So at this point, people are going to say bad things to you on the internet. And I have a lot of cool stories. And they're all really funny, once you're past the pain moment. But they're all really funny of people being awful to other people on the internet about open source. And they're funny, because I don't know them. But the thing is, I do know them, and you do know them. They're not funny. I mean, these are, these are conversations um, that are tearing people down. So while I did research and come up with several shining examples of bad behavior. I'm not going to share any of them with you today. One, because I don't think it's constructive. Um, and secondly, because I think it's actually destructive. Um, this point was, uh, I saw this quote in a Tom Nichols book. It's, the quote is actually from uh, David Dunning, if you've heard of the Dunning-Kruger effect. So the quote's actually from David Dunning. And it's, the point is, refuting a dumb idea requires repeating it at least once. So if you are engaging with the stupidity of the internet, by saying X is wrong, now X is out there twice. So, and I can guarantee you that if you're doing something right, 
a bunch of people are going to think you're doing it wrong. One of my favorite examples of this, and this also predates the internet, is this letter. And you can follow the link and read it. I'm sure you can't read it on here. Um, but this is a letter um, from T.S. Eliot to George Orwell, rejecting a story he had written for publication. The story is called Animal Farm. And he basically, he, he said, and he didn't like the politics of the story, and he basically said, actually in so many words, you know, I think what this neat story needs is not more communism, but more public-spirited pigs. So imagine the world where uh, Orwell took Eliot's advice and rewrote Animal Farm with the pigs discovering their public spirit at the end. I'm sure it would make a great Disney movie. People are going to come at you with rhetoric. And these are some phrases that, that I've seen. Why don't you just is a classic. Why don't you just X? Or the community needs Y. Or look at all the benefits. I mean, that was the problem that the kibitzers had, right? Each kibitzer giving advice had a specific benefit in mind. Like, we didn't need this, we don't need that, a specific issue. But you took the aggregate of all their effect, and you ended up somewhere that didn't make any sense at all. My project needs your blessing to succeed. Don't make a better X because X's feelings will be hurt. Uh, in Clojure, we try to think carefully and sometimes differently about things, and I'm surprised at how often I get this feedback. Right? I, you shouldn't have made X because it's better than Y, and Y's feelings are hurt. I, mean, I, I don't know how we can improve as industry if we're not going to try to make better things. Um, and you should run your project differently. Now, this is all rhetoric. It's definitely rhetoric. It's definitely aiming at influencing behavior, but I don't think the vast majority of it is malicious. I think that it's perceived as malicious, and it's painful to have these kinds of interactions, but I think you know, a lot of the time it comes from well-intentioned people zealously uh, pursuing their ideas of the good um, and having that bleed over into um, you know, tasking other people, basically. And there are some misconceptions behind this. Uh, one misconception is that, that ideas are novel, right? That the thing that you just thought of, you're the first person to have thunk it. Uh, another misconception is that coding is most of the work uh, in an open source project. Coding is the smallest part of the work, right? When somebody gives me code to put into a project that I will then maintain, I have the exact same, and, and if it's good code, I have the exact same feeling as if they gave me a puppy. Right? Because it's awesome. I like puppies. But someone's going to have to maintain that puppy. Right? And that puppy is going to get long in the tooth eventually. It's going to become a dog. It's, you know, it's going to need all these other things over time. And also, the answering is as easy as asking. The reality is quite the opposite of these things. Other people thought longer and harder about the problem than you did. That sounds a little bit arrogant until you really think about the fact that other people outnumber you six and a half billion to one. <laughs> right? So statistically, other people thought longer than harder than you did about it. That doesn't mean that your thoughts are not important, but it sets a perspective boundary. Uh, design dominates coding, and code without design can be worse than nothing. Uh, and certainly in the closure uh, language, we are very zealous uh, in not adding things. Like a lot. And, and that, that's where you get to assessment. You know, new ideas come along. Assessment is incredibly time consuming. My guess is that for every hour somebody spends coding a contribution to closure, four or five hours are spent assessing by other people and by that person, are spent assessing uh, the suitability. And the answer is almost always no. Like more than 90% of the time, the answer is no. Um, if you want to see projects that answer yes to new ideas more than 50% of the time. I think the Java eco JavaScript ecosystem is available uh, for, for seeing places where that happens. And it's a way to work, and it has outcomes that you can assess and decide if you like. Uh, answering questions is time consuming. Um, this is a point that Evan Chaplicki of Elm fame made in his talk at Strange Loop last year. Uh, five minutes to ask, two pages of careful writing to answer. Somebody asks a question about a corner of something in an open source project that you've worked on, and you're the primary maintainer of it. Um, the person's question is just water under the bridge, but your answer becomes a touchstone that people will argue about and say, look, the scripture has been laid down on this issue. And so the 
the sort of quality, even if you know the answer off the top of your head, the quality barrier on writing needs to be set higher. So asking is easy, answering is hard. Uh, Brian Getz made a similar point. Uh, Brian's the Java language architect at Oracle. He gave a great talk uh, at Closure Conj in 2014 called Stewardship, the Sobering Parts. And I, I, I'll read these. The things that he feels like he does, uh, internal responsibilities at Oracle, community, keeping features out, adding features, asking um, uh, what would um, J, uh, James Gosling do, prototyping, regretting serialization, interaction analysis. The thing I would point out about these is that the vast majority of this pie wheel is assessment. Very little of it is doing. And he goes on to make the point that the consequences of a small change are surprisingly expensive to estimate. Um, at Oracle, they actually have a giant corpus of Java code that's out in the wild, and they have tools to run proposed changes against that corpus, and millions of lines of Java code where they can try to see you know, what the effects of change are, because it's absolutely beyond human comprehension to say, you know, is, especially with serialization, poor serialization. But even uh, areas of Java that were better thought out to begin with, uh, very difficult to make those costs. And Brian goes so far as to make the argument that as a result, language maintainers of large and successful projects, their cost-benefit ratio leads them to ignore all small changes. Because even the small changes are expensive to assess. And so if you're gonna take the time to assess something, you might as well assess something that's really big ticket. You know, adding uh, functions into Java, that kind of thing, but not necessarily the thousands of bugs that are lying in the, in the bug database year in and year out. So maintaining software is stressful. People are mostly nice, but it doesn't feel like that on the internet, right? The rhetoric that you're gonna see in forums and in discussions and things is gonna be difficult to deal with. Expect a lot of pain and noise. Um, take some hope that people are better intentioned than the communications seem, and be good to yourself. And in three particular ways. Choose your objectives. Why are you here on this earth? What are you doing? Choose your obligations to other people, and choose your interactions. I'm not actually going to talk at all about this first one. I feel like there's a whole self-help industry and other things that can, I'm not gonna try to take that one on today, so I'm gonna focus on the other two. I, the only thing I would say about choosing your objectives is make sure that you're thoughtful about what your objectives are on a regular basis. And a lot of people will talk about this kind of practice. I mean, I like to get up in the morning and write down, before I start my day, what are my objectives in life and what am I doing about those objectives for like two minutes. I'm not advocating that particular practice, but those kinds of things where you are revisiting your objectives and, and saying, am I in fact doing the things that I wanna do you know, in the long term? I do wanna say quite a bit more though about choosing your obligations. Uh, in open source, if you're building open source, one of your obligations that you choose to take on is I wanna build some software. Another one is people are gonna have questions about the software. How do I use your software? They're gonna wanna, they're gonna wanna help. Another obligation that you could take on is considering contributions from others. Another obligation that you could take on is evangelizing, traveling to conferences, getting on airplanes, having to sprint through the Charlotte airport like I did yesterday. I went all the way from the bottom of Terminal C to the top of Terminal E in like four minutes. <laughs> it was cool. And it was cool, I was carrying my bag like a football. But it's tiring. Um, you get to choose your own personal workflow. You get to choose whether you use VS Code or IntelliJ or Emacs. Um, you get to choose what tools you use, to some degree. Now remember, I'm talking about open source here. I'm not talking about your job where you're getting paid. I'm talking about your life. You get to choose, in the broadest sense, what your time and availability is for all these things. Right? I made a thing. It was a cool thing. Do I choose to spend two hours answering questions about it from now until I'm 94? I'm not advocating yes or no, I'm advocating that it be a conscious choice. You say, where am I gonna put my time? Where am I gonna put my life? And then, of course, the really interesting one is defending your choices on social media. And this is when the rhetoric goes to the metagame level. When, when somebody shows up on Twitter and says to me, you know, hey, I wanna give you some input on your personal workflow and if you disagree with me, I would like for you to write an essay explaining why, or the implication of that. And so, you know, my 
life partner and I always refer to this XKCD cartoon. Um, it's time to go to bed, and I'll say to Joey, I can't come to bed right now. And she'll say, what? Some, somebody's wrong on the internet again? I'm like, yeah, it's, <laughs> you know, it just, it just keeps happening. Right? I, know it's, I know it's 1 o'clock in the morning, and I know I said I was only going to have one scotch, but I've had two now. And, and on and on and on. But I found, you know, someone else is wrong about the same thing. They're everywhere. We have to fix it. You can't fix it. I discovered, though, in thinking about this, um, you know, I have a, um, I guess, a logic brain approach to a lot of problem solving, which doesn't always work in these people problem kinds of areas. But one of the things that I always want to do is figure out where there are fallacies and arguments that cause people to go astray. Because I have this naive, perhaps, hope that if you identify fallacies, that you can improve the quality of conversation. And in thinking about the specific things that go wrong in open source interactions, I feel like I've discovered a fallacy that doesn't get talked about very often that quite dominates. So there are two fallacies that I'm, I'm interested in talking about here. One of them is the argument from authority. That's a fallacy you hear about all the time, right? You should do this because the lead developer says you should. Right? You should do this because the community says you should. You should do this because you know whoever. But it's actually the second fallacy I think is quite interesting. It's called the ambiguous collective. And the fallacy of the ambiguous collective is where you have a noun that represents some grouping that is open to being interpreted differently by different participants in the conversation. Right? So, so we're talking about having, having some aggregate noun. And I'll just go ahead and spill the beans. Community is a great one. Right? Someone says community. Right? I have a mental picture of what the community is. That person has a mental picture of what the community is. I can assure you that those pictures do not line up perfectly on average. And if you combine that with, say, Twitter threading, right, where you see the, argument, you know, the arguments happen out of order, and you see the angry response before the thing that triggered it. So you have these, these ambiguous nouns, and then arbitrary reordering of interactions, which are limited to 280 characters. Uh, it's a recipe for misunderstanding even when everybody's trying to be on their best behavior. So one of the things that I do, and I don't do this for others, I don't you know, write this on the internet, but for myself, when I'm communicating with people on Twitter and on social media and on email, I try to remove the ambiguous collective, rephrase to active voice, and always have actors and obligations be explicit. And so I'll walk through an example of that. What do creators owe communities? This seems like it matters with Guido having quit Python in despair. What does, what does Guido, the creator, owe the Python community, for example? Well, community is a double whammy, right? It's a reverse argument from authority, right? In the open source world, the community dominates any individual. So it is a kind of argument from authority. And it's an ambiguous collective. So rather than answering this question, what do creators owe communities? I would try to make those less ambiguous and say, for example, what do I owe the closure community? That's a lot less ambiguous. Right? I would say on one side, unless you want to get into theories of, of the mind and personality, that I is quite unambiguous. And the closure community, though, still ambiguous, so I can take this a step further. I can say, what do I owe closure contributors? And now, we have a very specific, and that's a link, by the way, to the guidelines for how to contribute to closure. So this is a specific thing, right? It is the people who have read these guidelines and choose to follow them to work on closure together. Uh, reframing the conversation like this um, helps me understand if I even want to participate in the conversations on social media. And I would much rather participate in conversations um, that are framed this way with specific nouns, uh, specific verbs, and we can take this further, right? We can make, these, make this into, you know, another good step is to make it measurable. How would I know if I had lived up to my chosen obligations to closure contributors? And so um, I choose to share and defend my choices in this talk and on social media. That is an, ob that is a, a, an obligation that I have chosen, not one that I am forced to. But I think this is interesting enough, and I have spent a ton of time thinking about it. And so th here they are. I choose to pick problems that are interesting to me, that I can think carefully and deeply about. That's what I'm interested in doing in my life as a software developer. 
I choose to give away software that may be of value to others. I give away my work on Clojure, my work on Clojure Script, and a bunch of supporting libraries. I choose to work with others who share a set of ideas about how to be responsible to each other, which is the Clojure community as defined. Um, I choose to teach and learn. I love talking, you may have noticed. I love talking to people. I love listening to people. I love hearing stories about what people are doing with software and the challenges that they have and, and relating them and trying to weave them together and find the common thread and to find points of simplicity. Uh, and I choose to do all of this at a tempo that is always dominated by my life and my family. So I'm gonna do this at a speed and on a schedule um, that works for me. So what can you expect if you organize yourself in this way? I have found uh, working in open source software to be a great benefit and gift to me in my life. That as much as I have given, I've gotten back a hundredfold. And I've gotten back in, in a global network of friends, uh, people like Bruce here in Chattanooga, Bruce and Maggie. Um, I have a sense of shared accomplishment and working with other people that I would never have met. Some people, in fact, who I never have met, right, in the sense of actually being you know, face to face. Um, I have opportunities for personal and intellectual growth that maybe rarely come up outside of the specifics of your uh, religious institution or your job, right, this, this extra thing. Um, and I have a sense of community and even family. And as a counterbalance to the difficulties of communication, there's lots of incredibly positive communication out there. Uh, Russ Olson is, uh, works with me at Cognitect, and he is not um, uh, particularly an expert in the area he's working here. And uh, he and uh, Jose had this conversation back and forth that's just a love fest of mutual respect, and here's my idea, and let me think about it, and really just adhering to this notion that there is a person on the other side of this conversation, and presuming you know, let's elevate the conversation at every step um, instead of let's look for what's the, you know, the worst thing we can see. Um, I also had a really positive, I know this happens to me once every six months or so, uh, Gene Kim, who is the author of the DevOps Handbook and the Phoenix Project and some other books about uh, getting things done, uh, uh, sent me this beautiful personal note, um, you know, and this is just amazing, right? I've never met this guy, I have now. Um, because you know, I immediately scheduled a lunch date you know, after that. But you know, these things are beautiful. So how to make software. Design software. Don't let it just happen to you. Grow your software. Abandon semantic versioning. Aim for simplicity in your designs. Try to find things that are complex and tear them apart. As you're interacting with other people, respect the process. Learn the community standards of the community that you aspire to be a part of. Know when to advocate, which is if, you don't, if you're not in a position of, of authority or power to demand things, then never. And disagree with civility. When you do this, it's still not gonna be easy. Expect opposition, right? There's opposition to everything. Opposition is okay. People are not going to all agree, and that's perfectly fine. Um, that opposition will show up wrapped in a ton of rhetoric, not for the most part because the rest of humanity is mean, but because it's really hard to write well and carefully. Right? It's much easier to write things that, that slide into the personal accidentally. Um, and there are misconceptions that lead directly to this. One of the biggest misconceptions is that ambiguous collective. Right? We both think we're talking about the same group, but we both have this notion of a group in our head, and they don't match. And be good to yourself. Choose your objectives. It's your life, you're the only person who gets to make those choices. Choose your obligations. When you're choosing how you spend your free time, choose what your obligations are gonna to be to support the things that you care about. And then choose the interactions that you're going to have with people. Uh, this has been Stewardship Made Practical. My name is Stuart Halloway. I wish you a great afternoon in Chattanooga. Try to stay warm and go and make something beautiful. Thank you. I think we can
and do uh, one question, and then I think you're hanging around if people want to stay in chat. I, as I said, I love to hear people's stories. I'm happy to hang around as long as we don't get thrown out of the building. Yeah. Anyone, questions? Cool. Well, uh, thank you guys for coming today. Um, I did have a couple more announcements. Hack night next Wednesday here um, at 6 p.m. And then we are still looking for sponsors for Chadev. Um, we're trying to step up our game and provide um, quality speakers and events and uh, food as well. And that takes sponsorship. So if you're interested or your company's interested, please come and see me. Thanks.